because I'm so not right for this role. I can't do this. <laughs> I've instantly got filled with fear, doubt, everything. I literally put my hand on the door and I twist the knob and I'm turning to go and the casting director goes, Troy, I think about that moment a lot. I would still be watching it, I would still be playing it. Um, but I would definitely be on the outside and not where I am right now. You trust me. The man, Troy Baker himself, is here. Troy, how you doing, man? I was halfway about to get up from my seat when you said there was like, they have the wrong person. They have the most <laughs> epic, oh my God, who is it? I am beyond excited to be here. Thank you guys for having me. Obviously, Thanks. we're gonna talk about one of the things that I'm most excited to talk about in my life. How do you describe the last few weeks? We, Neil Druckmann, who's of course um, one of the creators, he's at Naughty Dog, the studio that put the game out in 2013 and is now one of the showrunners for this show, this incredible, truly remarkable show on HBO, um, has just coined the best phrase and it's the most simple, cliche, trite word, but it's, it's surreal. I had this one moment when we were shooting my episode and I'm on set in this beautiful, very cold location. And we're sitting there and we're, we're getting, you know, cameras set up and everything and, and we're about to roll on our first shot and I'm by this beautiful river and it's cold and I just chuckled. And the person I'm next to goes, what are you laughing about? It's a very serious scene we're about to do. I was like, if you could go back 12 years to the version of me that walked into that audition on that sound stage and go, just to let you know, <laughs> this is gonna be the biggest thing you've ever been in your life. And you're gonna be standing here on a set of what will be, I think, one of the greatest television shows ever. I never would've believed it. When did it start to set in for you that like the game was really picking up and becoming a phenomenon and people were, like the story of the game, not just the gameplay, the story of the game was resonating with so many people. Those were two different beats. So the story hit me when Ashley Johnson, who played Ellie in the game, she and I first heard the story. And uh, Neil Druckmann and Bruce Straley brought us in and said, we want to give you the same pitch that we that we gave to Sony. Like, this is how we got to greenlight our game. Um, which is interesting to hear. You, you, you look back at it now and go, well, of course you would make that game. But at the time, Naughty Dog was made for, or you know, was known for making games like Uncharted was like a really big stretch for them. Um, they had done Crash Bandicoot and Jack, you know, so it's like that's not what they do. And they wanted to do this really, really gritty post-apocalyptic horror game um, that was about a love story. And it's like, that's not what we do. Um, so we sat down with them and they walked us through and it was about an hour long and they just beat by beat and we could see where it's like we're gonna fill this in and we're gonna figure out how we get here but they had the entire story laid out soup to nuts from the very beginning to the very end even to the last scene and at the time I smoked and they were like you want to guys take a break He's like yeah yeah let's take a break and Ash and I walked outside and I lit a cigarette and we just kind of both stared off blankly into the mid distance and I just said do you realize that if this thing sucks it's because of us <laughs> like we are the weakest link clearly and we were just overwhelmed because as a gamer myself too nobody was telling these stories in games and for for multiple reasons it's not that nobody wanted to it's that either the landscape wasn't available for it the ground wasn't ripe for it the technology didn't exist to support it the talent within the writing and and the directing wasn't there because uh, that's not where the focus was that's not what gamers thought that they wanted and true to form, people don't know what they want until you give it to them. But when it was something that was phenomenal, I, I still love whenever someone brings up the, uh, the, like someone gives me something to sign, if it's the first copy, like the first run of those games, you'll see a sticker on the says from the makers of Uncharted, which was even Sony going, see, we did good things, you'll like this one too. <laughs> um, but then all of a sudden it sells crazy and it's getting all of the awards and it's it's blowing people's minds and it becomes this this social event, it becomes this cultural phenomenon, as you said. Um, that's when I knew that we had done something that was way bigger than us, way bigger than a game, and here we are 10 years later. And the stories that people have told me, um, whether they be teenagers, um, whether it's now people who were too young to play the game when it first came out, but now they've played the game, and um, people who have reconnected with their parents, uh, people who have healed their relationship with their father or their daughter, 
um, has been one of the greatest, I think, um, byproducts of, of this story. And to think that now that is going to proliferate to a whole group of people who didn't have a PlayStation, who wouldn't ever pick up a controller, and are now watching this every Sunday night um, and crying all the tears that we've been doing for the last 10 years is just, like you said, it's phenomenal. There's been various conversations, I think, about this, the, the Last of Us being adapted to movies, to shows through the decades since the game came out. Did you ever have conversations with Neil or the team about you playing the character in live action? Yeah, I mean, those, the conversations are always popping up. Yeah. And the thing that I really respect about Neil is he was always focused, he's still to this day, he's always focused on the thing that is in front of him. Mm -hmm. And there's the tertiary conversation of, what does this look like if we do this, and, and maybe I could do this, but even when we were shooting the first game, it was, well, we gotta set this up for a franchise. Come on, let's, let's squeeze this out for, for three games. And he goes, I have to act like this is the only game we're gonna make. And I was like, people are gonna be pissed with this ending, dude. They're gonna, they're gonna riot with this ending. And he goes, good. I just don't want them to be ambivalent. If they hate it, fine. If they love it, great. But if they don't care, that means we didn't do our job. So he's always been focused on the story that he's telling the one that's in front of him. But when it came to, I mean, Neil was really kind. He's like, who would you want to play Joel? And I, I mean, I bounced around. Um, I remember we were talking about um, airport lounges. Uh, I've met Josh Brolin a handful of times, and the last time that I saw him was at LAX. And I was like, hey, man, I don't know if you remember this or not. You and I met in New Mexico. He was like, I do, I do. And I said, there may come a script across your desk, and, and before you either dismiss it either way, just give, give it a look, because I, I really think that you benefit from playing this character, and either the character would benefit from it being played by you. And he's like, well, give it a look, what's it called? It's like, it's called The Last of Us, and it's, it's a feature film right now that's being developed. He's like, okay, I'll take a look. And what's funny is, is that I think Josh Brolin would have been a great choice. I think that there's, you look at the character, especially in the game, and you go, yeah, that maps, 100%. Like that, that Josh Brolin playing that short. But what I love is when you get someone like Craig Mazin involved and these conversations between he and Neil Druckmann go back and forth that goes, what happens if we shake it up a little bit? And who do we get that can not only have, bring something new to it and something fresh to it, but also kind of change the character a little bit. We have an opportunity to do things differently here. And the second that Neil said, I think we got Pedro Pascal, I went, Oh, oh my God, that's perfect. It's perfect. Because first of all, he's an incredibly talented actor. Mm -hmm. And secondly, everybody loves him. So, people are gonna be like, well, I ha He's our daddy. Yeah, you, you, you gotta get him. Now. Everything on TikTok is Pedro Pascal. I'm all yeah. over him. Yeah. I can't yeah. get it, I can't And I can tell you this, that man, <laughs> I, there's some people where I'm like, oh, please be nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. just please be nice. And I love our first meeting. We were up in Calgary and I was having dinner and he passed behind me and we kind of waved through the window and he came back inside and he stood there awkwardly. And he's like, what are we doing here, man? Are we Spider-Man yeah, was like, Yeah, I was like, you be, and I was like, come here, dude. And we just gave a hug and I, I pulled him away and I was like, I have so many questions for you. And he goes, I have none for you. And I was like, oh, we're gonna go along great. Um, he's been incredibly kind and, and incredibly gracious. And what I love is that he's not trying to ape anything that we've done before. We, we did that. We shot it, lit it, scored it, released it, everything. It's, it's already been done. For me, my goal, and I've said this countless times, is I just wanted someone to show me something different. What did I miss? What was, what was underneath the floorboards? Or, or what rock did I not pick up? And, it's, it's a wonderful thing as an actor because I've never had this experience before. I, I, I can't think of any other actor that's had this experience where it's like you've had kind of authorship of something and a character, you got to see it put out, and now it's being done by a completely different person, but then you also get to be involved in it. Um, Colm Wilkinson, who played uh, Jean Valjean in the original um, Les Mis, was, you know, he, he played that character for I think 15 or 20 years and then retired from it, and then they brought him back. Um, not only to do this beautiful tribute to 
the, the musical and they lined up every person that plays Jean Valjean starting with him. And you could see the echoes of his performance in, in every character that it's done. And somehow they, they are standing on his shoulders. So they have to somehow emulate something that he did. But then also in the movie, he plays the priest that Jean Valjean steals the candlesticks from. And it's just like, what a great way to pay tribute. That's the only other example I can think of that I got to do. You've talked about how you think people are going to hate your character coming up when you show up on the show. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> Is it weird to play a part after playing Joel, which has, I mean, the character of Joel gets his own reactions, but overall I think is pretty beloved as a character. You're playing the opposite now. Sure. What's it like to kind of have to switch gears within a similar universe, even though it's a different medium? That's the gig, man. That, yeah. And that's something that I truly do enjoy. It is possible for an actor to just view the world and view the story from one lens. And I'm one of those people that subscribe to the theory that there are no villains. There's just a hero from a different perspective. I, I am 100% the hero of that story. And I'm living my movie of, of my own life. Um, and all of these other people are, you know, they, they, are, the, they are the antithesis of me. And they, they are the antagonist to my protagonist. Um, so being able to find, it's way more interesting to me to find the empathy in someone and try to understand their perspective. Especially like, that maps to reality. I think that you can't out hate somebody. Um, and that's why empathy has to be the key. I have to find a way to, number one, I have to be the problem because if you're the problem, I can't do anything about you. I can only do something about me. But mm -hmm. if I can make myself the problem and that makes it smaller, a little bit more manageable, and then if I can find a way to have empathy, then it makes the world easier to deal with. Yeah. I do want to say, I know we don't talk spoilers for the game that haven't happened on the show yet, so I'm just going to leave it at this. I know how this game ends. I was Team Joel the whole time. Mm. I'm just saying, I know it might be a controversial take. I, I was Team Joel. I Same. was Team Joel. Does Team Joel, I get to flip the script, does Team Joel mean team decision? Oh, yeah, I was with the I, I I think if I was in that position, I, I don't know, hopefully I never am, but I'm I'd be say, dead September 29th. <laughs> well, I'm, if I'm, oh, <laughs> yeah. 100, let's just, somebody asked me, he's like, would you wait to turn if you were bitten? I was like, you think I'd get bitten? Yeah. I am 1201, I am a corpse, there is no me. <laughs> but you don't think the game prepared, I watched The Walking Dead for 10 years now, I've played sure. through the last one, so I feel like a little bit I'm ready. Walking Dead, you're like, if I have a baseball bat and enough of a heads up, I can make it slow. That's true. I, <laughs> that's I can do slow, much slower. There's like plenty of allusions to Joel having a dark past. He's killed people before. He's done some things that might put him on, you know, Joel sees himself as a good guy because he's his own protagonist, but if you saw his actions, you might not know. I love to hear how much of Joel's like past that we didn't see in the game, that we don't see in the show, did you get to like flesh out? Do you have a headcanon of that you've just worked out over the years? Yes, and it's a wonderful, um, I think it's a wonderful exercise for an actor to come in, come in with a backstory. Everything should be motivated. Every decision that you make as an actor should be motivated by something. So if there's nothing there on the page that you're finding that's motivating you, make something up. And if it conflicts with the character, then that's the director's responsibility to tell you that. Um, but there's a lot. There was a shoot that we did, nobody knows about. How about I get in trouble for saying this? Um, in between part one and part two, where we were just kind of testing out some new tech, and so just Neil and I went down to a different stage than we shot on down in, in uh, San Diego, and he was like, I want to do a couple of scenes from this because I don't really have anything written so far, but I have an idea of the scene for this. Are you comfortable just kind of running a scene by yourself? I was like, sure. And so there's a scene in, that we just kind of made up on, on, on the fly about Joel going into a bar. and. So there are all of these backstory moments that we get to find out what happened. Where, where's Sarah's mom? Um, what happened to that relationship? What is the schism between he and Tommy? And the thing that I love about the show is, whereas in the game, the story is fundamental and it is foundational to the experience. But at the end of the day, it is a game and we need to do things that prompt the player and pull the player forward in the game. Um, and the use of story as a, as a mechanic for that is, is perfect. But a show, first of all, we're controlling where you're looking the entire time. So we have the opportunity to go, look over here for a second. If we, if we put the camera over here, we promise you that we'll make it compelling. Like we're gonna slow down and take you to a 20 year time lapse between Bill and Frank. 
character relationship you didn't think you cared anything about. But now it's the number, you'll never look at strawberries the same way again. <laughs> this is what the show has the ability to do. And that also says, well, let's take a look at Joel's backstory and let's, let's learn more about that. And that is, there's a beautiful thing that happens as you see now. Would you be interested in exploring that, more of that backstory, like if they did a prequel season or maybe a prequel game? The Last of Us Part Zero. Yes. As, yeah. Look, one of the things that I think is um, evidence that this is art. I think true art inspires other art and it inspires artists. Um, there are so many people that picked up the oboe because they heard you know, that cue that John Williams wrote for Star Wars when two suns were setting. They're like, I want to play th that instrument. So I think that's art, is when, um, how many people you know, started putting a chisel to marble after they saw the David. It's like, that is art. And I, I do put The Last of Us, the story, because I've, I've seen the evidence of it. I've seen people go, I've written my college thesis on this, mm -hmm. or I'm now in games. I'm now working at Naughty Dog because wow. of this game. Half of the people that work at Naughty Dog are because they're there because of The Last of Us. People that were in working on the show because of The Last of Us. There's just this, this byproduct again that happens when people get inspired by something, they get moved by something, that they want to be a part of making something. And so a lot of people have approached me and like, hey, this is a non-canonical story that I was inspired to write because of The Last of Us, would you want to be a part of it? My whole thing is this, and people always ask, is there gonna be a Last of Us part three? I have no idea, no idea. I didn't know it was gonna be a part two. <laughs> there he goes. But if Neil has a story that he wants to tell, um, and he wants me to be a part of it in any way, I am there seven days a week and twice on Sunday. I, I, I absolutely would, would follow him, and I have. I've followed him to the gates of hell and back, and bought ice cream. Um, <laughs> I love your little isms. <laughs> I, that's the Texas boy in me coming out, which is actually, I don't even remember, I don't remember there being anything in the audition sides, and maybe Neil could correct me on this, that said Joel was from Texas. It was just, when I looked at that character, I walked in, and boy, if you, you can Google it. It's not, my genes reflected light. It was not good. This was like 2008, 2009. Was your audition tape? Yeah, so like, Ed Hardy was still mildly acceptable on some <laughs> social levels. Mm -hmm. Um, and if they were sold out, you had affliction, it was not good. There was just, there was a lot of writing on all of my clothes. And I had this Final Fantasy haircut and I walked in and Neil's like, I was, I was so angry that my, I was a huge fan of Uncharted, I was a huge fan of Naughty Dog and my agent's like, I got you an audition for Naughty Dog. I was like, nailing it, awesome, what's it for? And she goes, I'm sending the audition sites through right now. And I was driving down to go have Thanksgiving dinner with a friend of mine. And I was like, I, I'm so angry with you right now because I'm so not right for this role. So not right for this. But I show up and I walk in. This is the soundstage on Culver Studios. Um, that's, I mean, historic lot. And the soundstage, there was an office right next to it and that's where they were holding auditions and they would walk you into the soundstage and there's where you do the thing. And I walk in and I look around the room and in every chair in the waiting room was some version of the guy on the page. And I'm like, I'm, I can't do this. <laughs> I instantly got filled with fear, doubt, everything. And there's a sign-in sheet. And you go in and you sign your name and they look to see, okay, so we're ready for you. And I was like, I haven't signed in yet. I could leave and nobody would know. Nobody would know. And I literally put my hand on the door and I twist the knob and I'm turning to go and the casting director goes, Troy? I went, yeah. She goes, they're ready for you. I'm like, guys, just get in the door. <laughs> yeah, let's just let's it, go. It works. <laughs> and you were that close to not being Joel. Yeah. That's unreal. That close. And I, I think about that moment a lot. Um, because again, this thing has changed my life. And not only that, but I would, I would still be watching it, I would still be playing it. Um, but I would definitely be on the outside and not where I am right now.